Hello everybody and welcome to the third presentation of Intersoft and Telecad 2022. Today I will discuss how to create blocks, line and element thicknesses, hatching and loading various underlays. So I hope it will be helpful for your working with the program. I will use this drawing that I've already drawn in and uh, in the previous presentation if you remember. Today we'll be using it somewhat. In the previous webinar, as well as in the first one, I have mentioned where the thickness of my pens for the layers is defined. As a reminder, this is the layer explorer. However, if you would prefer, you have to define a line that differs from what has already been defined in the layer, then of course you can also do that, and I will also show you how that is done. You can set this before you start drawing a line or any element, but you can do this at any time after you've drawn it. There are two different ways. If you enable the drawing option, you will not have access to the properties anymore. That means to the color and the line thickness settings. Therefore, the first, you first have to define, for example, a type of line, and then you can choose what you want to draw. I will choose absolutely everything here that is different to the layer. If you have a setting for the layer, it means that these settings are taken from the layer explorer and they are defined there. If you change anything here, please remember that, of course, when you change the layer, your element will not be modified. Let's say I'll draw this in red. I have some lines here, but of course, if you want to choose a different line, then these are available here too. Click on Add Line Types. You choose here from this list or from Browse and from Files with the extension LIN. I will choose one that shows that there are such specific lines, so maybe a zigzag. I can choose the thickness right away, so let's say it will be 0.05. And now I start drawing a line. I don't have line weight turned on. It is turned off by default. I have shown in previous webinars where it is turned on, on the status bar on the right side down here turning it on and off. It cannot be seen from a distance that this line is the zigzag. When I get closer, of course, this line will be shown as a zigzag. Here, however, I need to set the line weight scale and line type scale. Therefore, now I'll select both of these lines and from under the right button, I'll select properties. So I will modify it by typing 50 and you will see that this line is drawn in a slightly different way than the one and as you can see, they look completely different. Now, if I already have a line selected, I want it to be drawn differently. Let's say a circle. I mark it, and when I have the properties opened, I just modify them. And if I don't have the properties open, I can change it at the top. So, on the ribbon, I can change, for example, the thickness. But also in the properties, on the left, under the right button, I can change the type of line so that it is also a zigzag. And with a zigzag, it will be a good idea to define a different thickness scale. I would like to draw your attention to an important thing. If I select an element here, then here you have the line weight. And here, we still have thickness. These are two different things. Have a look. If I define the thickness for this element, basically nothing has changed. For this element, I can also change the thickness because it is thinly drawn so that you can see if something will be changing or not. The thickness is as if the height of an element in the plane. That is the thickness of the plane of your element. It is not the thickness of the line, but the height of the plane in which the element is inserted. So remember that thickness is quite different from line weight. In addition, there's another thickness. I'll go back to the top view here because it is simpler. One of these elements is a polyline. For a polyline, of course, I can again change the thickness of the line here, either here or here in the properties on the ribbon. On the other hand, I can still, in this bottom part of the properties, in the geometry, define for each segment. This is one segment, the second segment, third segment, and fourth segment. Of course, I don't know which segment is the first one, but I'll find out in a moment. It says vertex here, it's obviously a segment. And here, I can assign a different thickness for these segments. I can assign thickness, global width, and it could be, let's say, six for that polyline. 
And it has nothing to do with the thickness of the pen, because it is only the thickness of the polyline. Now I will mark the width of the first vertex. In the first segment it will be zero, but in the second segment it will be 50 to have a difference. Please note that I can give the same value for the segment, then it will be just one thickness of the polyline. However, I can also do something that makes it look like an arrow. If here it is different and other parameters than zero, then of course it will be just a narrowing line. So you can define each individual segment in the polyline this way. How can you switch between segments? Here's the vertex, and here there are four segments, and you can move between them. Each time you have the option of specifying the thickness of this polyline element at the beginning and at the end of it. To finalize the topic of the thickness of elements and lines, I want to draw your attention to an important fact. We go to the drawing settings. The easiest way to do this is right here, where your cursor coordinates are. When you double click here, the drawing settings window opens. Then you have the display tab and the line weight tab. And here you have a slider with which you can change the drawing accuracy. But this is only basically the accuracy of displaying these thicknesses. Please note that it shows up here in this list. The default is that if you set the thickness to 0.15 and 0.25, you won't see a difference until you actually zoom in on that line. This is only a display, meaning it has nothing to do with the actual thickness of the line or element. As for this printout, this is the setting that does not apply to your printout, only to the display on the screen. Also, just for your information, that is the drawing setting that you can modify. This, you can modify this if you need to. Now I can move on to the creation of blocks. In the previous presentation, I created some elements from which we will create blocks. I'm going to select this element. I think it's already an array block. I inserted it with an array, so all these chairs were one element, one group. To break them up, I'll make each element separate. Thus, we choose the option Explode. To create a block, I selected the elements. I can also click first create a block here from the home ribbon in the block part create block. I can select elements first or I can choose create block first. It doesn't matter, but I definitely have to name this block. Let's say it'll be set one. I'll pick the insertion point. I would like it to be exactly in the center of this table. So I have a choice. So I'll show the center here. If I had not selected these elements before, here I would click on this icon, Select Entities, and indicate these elements. And if I already have them selected, I just approve it with Enter. And now, if I want to insert a block, I click Insert Block. That is this icon here, and the last save blocks is here on the list. If you have any other blocks, they will of course appear in the list that you see here. It is also possible to insert a block from a file, but if, for example, you would like to set the scheme as a block, I would suggest you do it. I purposely copied this element into a new document. Here is point 0, 0. In the left part of this insertion window, it coincides with this X and Y. And now, if you insert a block from a file into the project, it has the insertion point at point zero comma zero, if that makes sense. And now I have this point zero comma zero slightly away from my table, which means that every time at the same distance and exactly at this distance, I'll have the insertion point, which means it will not be able to insert this table with these chairs precisely. So at this point, I would suggest moving this point, which is the center of the table, to point zero comma zero. For that, I need to turn off the relative coordinates and choose move to 0, 0. Now I'll save it on the desktop. Of course, I do not advise keeping it on your desktop, but to have one directory where you will save all these elements. The reason being that you can move this folder from your desktop somewhere, and the program will remember the path to this folder in the place where you created it first. Now, if I want to insert a block, I choose it from the file and browse. It was named table, and I insert it. And now please note okay, 
that my cursor is right on the zero point there where I drew it and saved the project. Thanks to this, I can insert it. Again, when inserting, we use a scale factor of one because I don't want to enlarge it. And now I can also indicate or enter the angle of rotation. You can create anonymous blocks, which, are without, which is without naming them, but to save the blocks, you need to go to the Tools ribbon. And here is the Explore Blocks icon. By default, this is the layout, but I personally prefer this window to be undocked, so you can change it. And on the left side, there is the whole explorer of all the elements that my project consists of. So the layer, dimension styles, and text styles. I personally prefer to use this layout. Here are all my saved blocks, plus this one that was inserted from the file. All these blocks have names. If you do not remember the name, then of course you can open the explorer, double click and insert it. The X and Y scale factor, and now let's say an angle of 45 degrees. You can enter them this way. You don't have to remember the names. If you don't want to save the block under some name, you can also create it in such an anonymous block. So you select elements with Control shift c Now the program will ask you here, in the left lower corner, for the insertion point. I will point to the center of my set of elements and Control shift v gives you the option to paste this block. Now if you look at their names, there are temporary names, strings of numbers and letters. But they are still blocks, meaning they are marked as individual elements. And now I'd like to show you how to create blocks with attributes. I'm going to make a table, let's say 50 by 10. It's small, but it all depends on the size that you want to be defined as a block with attributes. Here's a line, but I'll make the start at a distance of 10 units, as that will be enough for me. Now I'm going to enter the text. As for text, I'm going to discuss it in more detail in the next presentation. So now I'm just going to change the size of that text and enter M2 and convert that to into a square, which is the square meter symbol. And I will save such a block, therefore, create block, table, and indicate the insertion point. And now on the home ribbon, in the block part, you have define attributes. You define elements of your block that can change. This will be the table for the room. So for example, room number, I choose one, and it will be placed in the middle. Text height, two, okay. So I'm putting this number in here. You could use the line here, it is obviously imprecise. If I had drawn the line first and then inserted the text, it would have been more precise. But that's not all that important right now. Now I'll define the attributes. Here we have room name. So living, that's the first room, and then living. will be in the middle. And I'll show more or less in the middle here, as you can see. And the next attribute will be the floor. So we have floor, which will make parquet. And in the middle will be fine. And 
now for the lines that I don't need, I'll just remove. Sorry, uh, one last attribute, which is the area. The area, by default, will be 26 and a half. And from the right for a change. And that will be defined here. Now I delete unnecessary lines. I select everything to be uh, my new block and create a room table block. And we insert by this corner. And now the program has accepted the basic data that has been entered. And now, if I insert this table, I show where I want to enter it. The program asks for the scale. I want exactly the scale I entered, so it will be one, and the angle of rotation is zero. Now the program asks for the area. Let's say it will be 25 and a half, a bit less for a change. So parquet. And I approve by enter. If I want to change something, I simply type something else. The living room will be my room. And the number will be 2. And in this way, such tables, or generally blocks with attributes, can be entered and defined. And of course, you can modify these parameters with each new entry. When you need, double-click on it and edit it. If you mark a given parameter here, you can change it. I'll change it to 15 so that it can be seen better. This is how you can define these blocks with attributes. Now I'll introduce hatching. Let me draw a rectangle with openings. On the home ribbon, I choose the hatch option and on the right, under the Island Detection option, I'll select Ignore, and I indicate where. Please note everything within my rectangle has been hatched. The drawn element that has been placed inside the rectangle has been ignored and also hatched. The right mouse button and the Enter button approve the option. Now I can, for example, change the scale of the hatching, color, background for the hatching, and of course, for example, choose a different type of this hatching. What I mean is a different pattern. This one's pretty. If you set a scale for one pattern, this scale may be too large or too small for another pattern. You can always change the scale in the properties window on the left here. I think that for me, 10 should be okay. I will now remove this hatching and insert it again, but this time I'll choose a different type. Let's say it will be just hatching and now I'll select only the outside. I don't have any additional islands inside, I only have this one island, so now the hatching will only apply around the circle of ours. In the lower right corner there is a cutoff of a fragment of a rectangle. So the program will read this shape by itself regardless of what the setting will be here. So we were not talking about this. If on this island, that is my circle, I draw another one, then when I choose the normal option, every second island will be hatched. Then if I choose only the outer one, then only the outside area. All others will be left blank. It all depends on how you want to introduce this hatching. The same will apply to gradients. You can choose the colors on one side or the other. If you want, to, if you want your color to be uniform, you select solid in the hatching. This is the first option. And in the other predefined ones, this is the first pattern. 
So now I just indicate where I want this hatching and confirm with the right mouse button and click OK. Remember that you introduce hatching into a closed area, that is into circles and closed polylines. You cannot hatch them into open elements. You must close the area to introduce the hatching. I will also introduce hatching on this circle, but I'll introduce it with the solid option and I will tell you about the display order. If I didn't have these lines, of course, I would show you the whole circle at once, but the lines are there, so they separate the circle from me. In this instance, it is good that my hatching has gone under the line, but if I wanted this hatching to be above the lines, under the right mouse button I can select the display order from the list and say that the hatching is on top, and now you don't see the lines anymore. On the edit ribbon, you also have this part here, draw order, and I can choose and send hatches back, which will mean that all the hatchings in the whole document will automatically go under all the elements that are on top of them. You can define the same for texts, only I assume that you will rather want the text to be on top, the same as dimension. So please remember that the options selected under this icon will apply to the whole document. On the other hand, if you want to select a particular element or the one that you're about to select, you can either select it from the icon front or you can simply select the element with the right mouse button and specify the display order. Define what you want to do with it, put it under or on top. You can display each element in a different way. Now I'm going to move on to the loading the different underlays. I'm going to start with the raster underlay. On the insert ribbon, you have basically all the available possible elements to load. And I'm going to start with the raster underlay. So here, from the attach icon in the data section, you click attach image. In each user's documents, after installing IntelliCAD, there are sample projects where there is, amongst others, a TIFF file with a map, which is what I want to use now. And here's some info. What I'm going to do now is only for the raster file with such extensions as JPEG, TIFF, or PNG. I'll have to scale it. I will enter it, but it will not be at the scale it was. Because when scaling the underlay through the resolution, this scale was disturbed. So I'll have to scale this in a moment. If someone has positioning files, then you click here on the Use Positioning File and click on this icon with three dots. Here you see the input formats that are IntelliCAD program can insert. Then this underlay will be automatically entered in the coordinates that should be entered and then additionally scaled. If you don't have that file at the moment, you can just click OK, show where you want to enter it, and confirm with Enter. And now I'm going to check what the scale is. So I'm going to look at the characteristic points or a line or a length that I know and it may be dimensioned. On the map, of course, the crosses are the kind of elements that we all know at what distance they are. The map was at a scale of 1 to 500, so these crosses should be 50 meters apart. So the unit of drawing for me at this point would be a meter. I check with the option Distance, select two points, and I see the result. It is not 50, so I need to rescale. And now, how do you scale? There are three possibilities. The first one, I take a calculator, type 50, and divide by my converted value, this one, between the crosshairs. What I come up with is the scale factor, which is entered in the window next to the cursor after pointing to the map. If you do not want to use the calculator, you can choose the fitting option. In this case, it would be useful to turn on ortho. It is the easiest way to do this as you get close to the crosses as possible. There will not be too much precision here because remember that the raster underlay is seen by the program in its entirety, which means that I can only select the frame. The entity snap will only stick to the edge, not the underlay. I'm drawing the first line between the crosses. Now the second line that is 50 meters, which is to be the distance of these crosses. And I choose, you can say scale, but I'll actually choose the align option. The program asks me for the first source point. So the first cross on the map. 
the line is drawn horizontally so that the map does not twist and I simply use the snap points. Then the second source point, which is the second cross, and the end of my default line. I do not have the third point because the map is two dimensional, so I just approve it with enter. And the last question, if I want to scale it, yes, of course, I want the letter Y to be confirmed with enter. I delete this line and check the distance between the vertices. And as you can see, it's a little bit over 50. As the accuracy is not very high here, because it's hard to hit the points perfectly. Remember that these are meters, not centimeters. So here in the map, in the drawing, you won't see this inaccuracy. This is the second way to scale the map. I'll go back now and show you one more way to scale the map using scale, but in a different way than the first one. I select the scale option, click on the place from which the map is scaled. And here at the cursor, unfortunately you can't see it, but in the bottom left corner, you can see I have something like a reference. So I select the letter R and confirm with enter. And what does this reference mean? Namely that I can now show a known distance. For example, the distance between two crosses. With two clicks and the program asks me to give the distance, which is 50 meters in this case. I confirm 50 with enter, and it has scaled without drawing any additional lines. I'll check on the other two crosses. It's still not very precise, but so don't worry. I have a slightly different value here, but it's still almost 50 meters. So these are ways to rescale elements. To sum up, please remember that when it comes to calibration, make sure it is in the right coordinates and the appropriate scale. And one more thing, when you're going to give someone a file with just such a raster, remember that you also have to give this raster to them. And the person who's going to open the file has to have the file and the raster in the same directory. Then all of these elements will be visible in the drawing. Another element that you can insert into your project is the PDF underlay. If you click the PDF underlay icon here, you open it, and the program asks you which page you want to open, whether you have one page because it's only a single page PDF or several, you always have to confirm that it's this page or the next one and confirm with enter. The insertion point and scale will be the same as for a raster. Here you can only change the angle or not change it. So I confirmed it with enter and put it at an angle of zero. And now it's basically exactly the same as, as if you're inserting a raster. Please note, I'm selecting the whole thing, which means that you also now have to scale it. Of course, which means I find and get closer to the points I know and choose one of the methods for rescaling that I have shown you. So that's what I leave you to do. There's another way to insert a PDF. Here you have one layer, as it was with a new document. I only inserted it here once. I didn't set any layers. I'm showing it on purpose because now I'm going to introduce the same PDF underlay, but in a slightly different way. If I choose import, that is the icon more or less in the middle of this ribbon, a window will open that will want to open a DWG by default because you can also insert a DWG file as an underlay. But I will want to change this to PDF here in the type and I choose the file that I have just uh, selected. A dialog box will appear where I can define elements. If the PDF was vector saved, you can load it in such a way that it will not only be one large map, but there will be lines, polylines or circles. And in this window, you can define that text will be texts and that layers will be taken from the PDF if they are there. And it will look completely different to just one big background. You'll be able to simply edit it. I check OK and insert it. In theory, I insert it in the same way, which is at the indicated point. This underlay has some elements, so it will take a while, but I will still have to scale it, but it will already be as lines. 
It will be easy to measure the distance between, for example, dimensioned elements or those lines of which you already know the distance. And in this way, as before, you can also scale your drawing. In a moment, I'll show you how things look when it comes to layers, because it will look a little bit different to the previous PDF. It will no longer be just one or two layers, but you will have several or a dozen or several dozen layers, depending on how much information the PDF file contains. When you look at the layers now, first you have the information of what they are referring to. So PDF underscore and the names of the layers that are introduced. However, here, after selecting it, you can see that it is a spline or a polyline. Here you can continue to work as with CAD elements. Just remember to check what it is and the scale and to scale it if necessary. This may come in handy because the input PDF will also have not have a specific scale. Now I would like to talk a little on the topic of PDF exports. Please note how I set up the drawing now. Even though it is not all visible, the whole drawing will still be saved to this PDF. If you want to specify exactly what should be on the exported PDF, for example, you have a floor plan and there are five floor plans next to each other in the project, you probably won't want to show all of them at once in one PDF, but set them up so that each one is separate. This is, just as you set it up here in the drawing, you want to save the PDF. Then I suggest you download a PDF printer and select the program icon. I'll discuss the sheets at one of the next webinars, so I encourage you to watch those. Now I choose Print to PDF, not Export to PDF, because only when I print to PDF, I'll be able to define the layout exactly as I want it. I have one more layout left to show you. We can attach it via the Attach icon or the XREF Manager. I will choose something from the library, one of the examples that is added to the program. I can define the scale, I choose whether it is an attachment or an overlay and I click OK. I indicate where I want to put it. I can still decide if I want to scale it as I would if it were inserting a block. So in X and Y and angle zero. And now I'm going to close this for a moment. I'm going to go into the XRIF manager again now for a moment so that you can see it better. First of all, please remember, if you're passing this document on to someone, it's got to be together with this file. And again, just like with a PDF or raster underlay, the software remembers the path to that file. So it's very important to give that file so when someone opens it, they have all the files in the same directory. Then when they open it, regardless of where you have kept the file on your desk, you can just click here on this Bind an External Reference button and then all these underlays will insert themselves into the document and you won't have to remember to attach them. The only thing you need to check then is that the weight of your file. It may increase significantly, so when you're going to send it, it will make a difference. What you can do instead is that you attach this DWG reference of yours to the drawing and it will already be an integral part of the drawing. Sometimes a DWG file is attached to a document and then you open the file you attached and modify something in it. To have it refreshed as a reference, you simply go to the external reference, select it, click reload, and you don't have to show it uh, where it is or to scale it. It will automatically refresh itself, showing you all the changes that have been made here as well. So it would be a good idea to remember that. And above all, when you will be transferring the file to another computer, remember to send this file together with the additional elements. You can also, on the output ribbon, go to the eTransit option, pack your files into one package, and send it to someone who will just unpack it. And then you won't forget any of the files. All right, that will be it for today. I, of course, encourage you to come to our webinars and subscribe to our channel to receive notifications about upcoming trainings. In the next IntelliCAD webinar, I'll cover single and multi-line text inputs, text styles, dimension introduction, and styles, and all related topics. I'll also show you how to enter and define tables, such that these new options of Intersoft IntelliCAD 22 can be better used. Thank you for your participation today, and if uh, you will be around at the next one, we shall continue.